So if you are new here, this slideshow will be in a way that you don't have to have read the book. Obviously, if you read the book, you'll understand it better. But also, this isn't a substitute for the book. So if you like this video or like this stream, go ahead and get the book. It was so good. Angel Davis was such a phenomenal like order. And while the last video we did was a lot more depressing and heavy, this talks obviously a lot about depressing and heavy stuff. But I found it almost weirdly uplifting in a way of like, I sort of left the book with this taste of no matter how dark and gritty and horrible we got, I almost always left every situation to where it was like, we could do better and we have done better and we just need to work to get back to where that was. Okay. So this is going to be about Angela Davis's women, race, and class. Some background info when it comes to Angela Davis. This book was originally published in 1981. There are going to be some things that not necessarily outdated, but they sort of date the book. Angela Davis was born in 1944. She's been an extremely, extremely influential activist almost her entire life. She identifies as a Marxist. She's been a longtime Communist Party USA member. She founded the Committees of Correspondence for Democracy and Socialism in Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World in 2020. She was featured. She was also arrested in 1971 by the Ronald Reagan administration. She became widely known as a champion to the left because of this arrest and was even in John Lennon and Yoko Ono's song titled Angela. That song was about her. And she was acquitted of all those charges in 1972. So she was seen as this radical, like, against the grain figure in American history, which is sick. Uh, she's awesome. Throughout this entire thing, there's going to be this very big trigger warning. We're going to be discussing things uh, like shadow slavery, a little bit of the torturous conditions that slaves were put under in the South throughout our history. There's going to be um, mentions of and sexual assault. It's not too crazy. I didn't put any descriptions or anything like that in the slideshow. In the book itself, there was also use of the N-word and also the Spanish word for black that I'm not going to use because of course not, but just be aware that I will be talking about some pretty heavy topics. So first off, in the first chapter, she describes sort of the history of chattel slavery in the United States. So of course, this book is going to be focusing a lot on women's perspective under shadow slavery and throughout all of American history. So black female slaves have been kind of underexamined in that regard. They've kind of been misrepresented in the history. Women and men were both treated as genderless when it came to slave work. Men and women were both out in the fields. And when it came to housework, they were both expected to do kind of the same thing. Racist depictions historically contrast this with figures such as Uncle Tom and Sambo, for men and then like Aunt Jemima and the Black Mammy for women, which the women were often depicted as being in the house. That just wasn't historically the case. Slave women were in the field just as much as men. However, they were victims of sexual violence on top of the violence that all slaves were subjected to. So around 1808, there was the abolition of the slave trade. When this happened, slave women were started to be classified as breeders because people could no longer purchase slaves directly from Africa or wherever they were procuring their slaves, they now had to like create their own, which is obviously terrible. So abolition actually increased sexual violence on slave women. It doesn't mean it wasn't a good thing, but that's just something that was a result of it. There was even a South Carolina court ruling in 1809 that female slaves had no legal claims to their children. That was the property of the slave owner. There's a quote here from the book. Children should be sold away from their mothers at any age because the young of slaves stand on the same footing as other animals. So South Carolina government actually put slave children and slaves in general on the same level as just being livestock. Now, if you know anything about American history, that shouldn't come as much of a surprise, but it's still harrowing nonetheless. So slave women were forced to have children and continue working the fields. Sometimes the woman would take the child with them and sort of put them on the side of the field and then continue working and have to come back and check on them without losing efficiency in their work. Others would design like rudimentary knapsacks to hold children on their backs while they were working. And because of this irregularity of feeding children, they would always have an overproduction of milk, which would obviously cause more pain in women. The economics of slave women in America is actually modeled after white slave labor in England. So Karl Marx says in the capital, in England, women are still occasionally used instead of horses for hauling canal boats because the labor required to produce horses and machines is an accurately known quantity, while that required to maintain the women of surplus population is below all calculation. And so women were often used as more of the work because it was cheaper to use female slaves than any other alternative, whether that be male slaves or 
horses and, and machinery. With the Industrial Revolution on a wider scale, this led to the removal of like more feminine considered jobs in the workplace. So a lot of women would be versed in sewing and using spinning wheels. That got turned into textiles and large factories. Candle making tools were obsoleted because now they can be made in a factory. Women started to become synonymous with the terms wife and mother. They were starting to lose all across womanhood in the Western world, their sense of individuality. They were both seen as inferior to wage labor. And of course, slave women were not giving these labels. And actually, birth records would often omit their father's names uh, to the children. And the slave owners sort of forced a matriarchal family arrangement. The opposite is often assumed in a very racist manner, which can be seen in something called the Moynihan Report. The Moynihan Report was written in 1965, not all that long ago, only 60 years ago. Many people have parents that are old. My, one of my parents is older than this report. So this was a government funded study on black families in the United States. They implied that black people's oppression within the United States was the fault of black males leaving the family, not because of systemic or social racism. There was another sociologist who was a liberal on the matter, Lee Rainwater, who proposed better wages and economic reforms to help black people, which totally makes sense, right? That's the basics of like socialism or any method of wealth distribution to allow people who are poor to rise up and join the ranks along everybody else. However, even Rainwater pushed racist ideology that the black family is forever broken by slavery and was sort of implying that black men aren't welcome in their own families. So even one of the liberal thought leaders in this regard was like, ah, we can't save black people. They're forever broken by slavery, which is, of course, an extremely racist thing to say. No, not you, mom. You're not older than the Moynihan report. Um, there are things in this PowerPoint that you are older than. But my point being with that is not that my mom is old or my dad is old. It's just that it's not that long ago. And this line of thinking was not that long ago. So these studies were contradicted by Herbert Gutman's The Black Family and Slavery and Freedom, where he described black family relations surviving the atrocities of slavery despite the forced separation done by slavers. When it comes to white women, there was a lot of housework for women. White, white women were demeaned and relegated almost to doing housework in modern in the societies back then. Slave households didn't suffer from this though because slave men and slave women were seen as equals. Households were the only reprieve they had from slave work. So there was a sexual equality observed in the slave household. That's something that white people were not able to hold. White women at the time were seen as like far superior within their own societies. Slave women were seen as equals. So you can see this in things like men doing the gardening and hunting and women cooking and sewing. All of these are very, very vital things to the household. And they, and they provided it equally. Angel Davis actually wrote an essay in 1971 while in prison on this topic, quote, in the infinite anguish of ministering to the needs of the men and children around her, she was performing the only labor of the slave community, which could not be directly and immediately claimed by the oppressor. There was no compensation for the work in the fields. It served no useful purpose for the slaves. Domestic labor was the only meaningful la labor for the slave community as a whole. So it allowed slave men and slave women to actually harbor a sense of things that they could do that the slave masters can't own, which actually generated a very healthy, all things considered, life between slave men and slave women. When it comes to fighting against slavery, women were at the forefront of abolition. In Natchez, Louisiana, there was a slave woman who ran a midnight school who was trying to teach people how to read and write and end up teaching hundreds of slaves how to read and write, which was very frowned upon uh, by slave masters. Harriet Tubman, of course, extremely famous uh, abolitionist, over 300 people rescued from the Underground Railroad just through Harriet Tubman's help alone. And she was the first and only woman to lead U.S. troops into battle. I do have an asterisk here because, again, this book was released in 1981. According to Google, Captain Linda Bray in 1989 was credited as the first woman to lead troops in the battle. This is obviously just a razor of like Harriet Tubman's accomplishments here. But I just also want to add, it has been done before. I'm guessing that the war against slavery had a much truer cause than whatever war Linda Bray was fighting in 1999. But like, I don't know where we're in, like in the Gulf Wars, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, Harriet Tubman is awesome. I just heard this amazing story about how she had like a piece of metal and like lodged into her brain for like the majority of her life while working through the Underground Railroad. And it was sort of a known thing that like she would sometimes just pass out while you were going on the Underground Railroad, but she was still able to help so many people. And it sort of became like a rite of passage for people to be there and help her while she was doing this. Some people would see her pass out and then run away and then get caught. So it's actually safer to stay with a passed out Harriet Tubman than it was to run and try to, you know, fend for yourself. 
which just speaks to how amazing of a person Harriet Tubman was. Now, this is true across almost all of history. Sexual assault was used as a political weapon against slaves, uh, black women once they were no longer slaves, and of course still to this day. It was used as a way to diminish women's will to resist being the slaves and also to, dem to demoralize the slave men. The U.S. military in Vietnam actually used an unwritten policy where GIs were encouraged to assault Vietnamese women and girls, which is horrible. It's obviously disgusting, disgusting stuff. These parallels between the Vietnamese war can be drawn back to black slaves abuse. This has been downplayed in U.S. shadow slavery. It sort of assumed that the slave women were happy to be involved with the white men. And it was deemed as simply miscegenation and not sexual abuse, which completely erases the guilt from the white slave owners. It was just a complete whitewashing of sexual assault that was washed away as just simply race mixing. Thomas Jefferson gets this all the time, right? So that was the first chapter. It sort of overlines a lot of stuff. And maybe this is just my lack of reading a nonfiction works. But you'll see a lot of like time jumps back and forth. I'm going to try to keep it in order. But now we're going to go on to the anti-slavery movement and the birth of women's rights chapter two. So you can't talk about this stuff without first talking about Frederick Douglass. He was one of the earliest advocate for women's rights. And it was super important, of course, because he was a man, a black man. He was called a woman's rights man as a derogatory but he did not personally feel demeaned by this. The term N-word lovers was also used to describe white women who supported abolition. And Frederick Douglass knew that this was used to separate the power the two causes could have together. Because when you're fighting against a, a powerful oppressing class, they want to splinter away groups that could help each other as much as possible. So white women who wanted more rights were trying to work with an abolitionist movement and the powers that be were trying to drive a wedge between those two things. Frederick Douglass has a quote here, when the true history of the anti-slavery cause shall be written, women will occupy a large space in its pages for the cause of the slave has been peculiarly women's cause. Hard word to say. So in the early abolitionist and feminist movement, middle-class white women started to recognize their societal positioning. They were sort of seen as not too far from that of slaves, which is obviously a gross overrepresentation of their plithes. But they were seeing that because of industrialization and being seen as only mothers and wives, that they have lost a lot of their social worth. This resulted, of course, from them having just more free time because they were middle class white women, because they were rich or -er. they weren't working all day like wage earners were. So because they had this extra time, they wanted to go and, and do activism. So working white women, while they were also highly oppressed, they were working with extremely low wages, horrible working conditions at the time. and they were the ones who were invoking the image of slavery much less often. So these people who were arguably much more oppressed were less using that idea of slavery because they didn't, they kind of didn't have time to, or the means to, they just wanted to work to get food on the table to help keep their family alive. Comparing middle-class women to slaves was primarily done for shock value as a way to get attention. And that kind of had the, you know, the implication that marriage is the same thing as slavery, which again, at the time, marriage was not a very equal thing. But of course, though, was not nearly as bad as shadow slavery. Some of the early women involved in this movement are Lucretia Mott and the Grimke sisters. So Mott was a Quaker woman who fought for abolition. She founded the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society, and her home was used in the Underground Railroad. She helped a lot with that kind of stuff. And the Grimke sisters, they were born actually into a slaveholding family. They moved north from South Carolina and gave rallies to mixed crowds denouncing slavery. They were so appalled by their upbringing that they wanted to go and fight for an abolitionist cause. And they tied slavery to the oppression of women in the sense that as long as slavery existed, women would also be oppressed under the same auspices that a white man is the highest of hierarchical tiers. So there was a Massachusetts Protestants retaliation. So there was this like common thought that men were just straight up objectively superior to women. A minister in Massachusetts in response to the Grimke sisters actions said, quote, we appreciate the unaustereous prayers of women in advancing the cause of religion. But when she assumes the place and tone of a man as a public reformer, she yields the power which God has given her for her protection. 
and her character becomes unnatural. If the vine whose strength and beauty is to lean on the trellis work and half conceal its cluster thinks to assume the independence and overshadowing nature of the elm, it will not only cease to bear fruit, but fall in shame and dishonor into the dust. So this Protestant minister just said, if women get too outspoken about all this oppression going on, nobody's going to want to have sex with them anymore. And so they should stop it because that's not a woman's job. It's a man's job to decide what is good to do in God's eyes, which is such a backwards way of thinking, of course. So the church just wants women to be members and to have babies to boost its numbers, but they don't want them to actually contribute meaningfully in the men's game of thinking. The Grimke sisters, they didn't like that. They retaliated with letters on the equality of the sexes. And they laid out that men and women were created equal and they fought for the continuance of public speaking for women, saying, quote, if we surrender the right to speak in public this year, we must surrender on the right to petition next year and the right to write the year after and so on. What then can women do for the slave when she herself is under the feet of man and shamed into silence? So they very clearly and very brilliantly pointed out that there is going to be this slippery slope of regressing women's power and without women's slight powers now, how would they ever actually fight for abolition? The Grimke sisters did a really, really great job of tying women's rights to abolition because they truly believed that everybody should be equal. It was a very, very progressive stance in the 1800s. This next chapter was about class and race in the early women's rights campaign. So in 1840, there is the World Anti-Slavery Convention. This was hosted in London and women were not invited to speak at the event, even though they were invited to attend. So this angered Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who are big time players in the women's suffrage movement in the United States. Stanton was labeled then as the wife of an abolitionist leader, but she began her U.S. activism with Mott following this convention. She was so upset that the fact that women were not able to be uh, speaking here that she just wanted to go start her own movement. So she organized a convention in 1848 in New York and proposed a resolution to push for women's suffrage. This was extremely radical, even for Mott. The idea of women's suffrage was something that was not really trying to be fought for at the time. And really only Frederick Douglass at this convention supported it. There were over 300 plus men and women arguing about women's suffrage due mainly to Douglass's endorsement. So this wouldn't even have gotten off the ground if not for Frederick Douglass's endorsement of the issue. That's how respected and how important Frederick Douglass was to the cause of women suffrage. Around the same time, Douglas spoke at a national convention of colored freedmen and pushed for the group to support women's suffrage. Again, we're seeing this trying to bond together the two groups to help fight against the current power structure. Stanton Seneca Falls Convention, however, fell short because it spoke mainly of middle class issues for women, Stanton being a middle class woman herself. They spoke about marriage stripping women of independence, both economically and morally, and how the divorce laws of the time were highly patriarchal. Working white women became a powerful section of labor force in the 1820s. For example, mill women staged strikes that would go, they were trying to fight against this 12 to 16 hour work day. They wanted to get down to eight hour work days, which, you know, now is seen as normal. Back then, an eight hour work day was not the norm by far. But 1848 conditions had worsened though, and immigrants were offered low wages in place of mill women striking. So this was building the industrial proletariat. Working women had to rely on the power of their labor, and they didn't have anything else. They weren't born into high earning families. They didn't have anything to fall back on. And this workforce was previously comprised of well-born Yankee families, as the book says. And now it's being replaced by immigrant families who will need to work. They can work for any wages because they just need wages. So Charlotte Woodward was one of these working women that petitioned for equal labor rights at this Seneca Falls convention. Lucretia Mott mentioned in the very last section, in the very, very last session of the convention, a call for equal participation of men and women in the labor force. Woodward was the only woman in that entire convention to live long enough to vote in the United States. And so while Mott did finally mention a call for labor rights among women. It was almost seen as a like a throwaway, like, oh yeah, we'll give this to the working class women because Lucretia Mott was almost more selfishly involved and was very, very focused on the white middle class causes um, that she was a member of, the white middle class. Black voices were noticeably absent from Stanton's calls for suffrage. Uh, one black man present, there were no black women at the entire convention. The Grimka sisters had previously chastised female anti-slavery societies because of this, because they historically have 
omitted black voices and they started to manifest racist prejudices within them. So then comes along Maria Stewart. She was the first native born woman to speak to crowds of both men and women in the United States. She wrote in the first black newspaper a, and she published this letter from a Matilda in 1827, which demanded education for black women, which at the time was, of course, extremely controversial. She was not recognized at the Seneca Falls Convention. She was there, but Lucretia Mott did not allow Maria Stewart to speak. This failure to integrate black women into the movement was very damaging to both movements, both abolition movement and the women's suffrage movement. And so, Sojourner Truth, uh, I maybe I did learn about Sojourner Truth in when I was growing up and I just forgot it. I don't know how Sojourner Truth isn't like plastered everywhere. Uh, she attended the first national convention on women's rights, which was two years after that Seneca Falls convention. She may not have actually been invited, but she just started speaking at the conventions because she was such a powerful presence. But in 1851, at the Ohio Women's Convention, she was the only black woman there, and it was said that her voice bellowed like rolling thunder. It quieted the room of the hostile men, and she gave an iconic speech titled, Ain't I a Woman? So I'm going to play this reenactment of it because it's such a powerful, powerful speech. Sojourner Truth is an ex-slave speaking in a room full of middle-class white women at a thing that she probably wasn't even invited to, trying to get her point across. Well, children, where there is so much racket, there must be something out of kilter. That man over there says that women need to be helped in the carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. I have plowed and planted and gathered into bonds and no man could head me. And ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have borne 13 children and seen most all sold off to slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? So again, this is a speech given in front of a room full of women who were primarily a, a working or a, a middle class white women and men who didn't invite Sojourner to speak. And she just went up there and delivered like, I mean, every time I, I read it or I hear it, it's just it gives me chills. So the, the big argument that they were having was women can't be voting or like doing this stuff. Women are so delicate that you have to help them get out of a carriage or like if there's a puddle, you have to help them over the puddle. And as an ex-slave and a black woman, she just pointed out, like, I've never been helped out of a carriage. I've never been helped over a puddle. And I'm a woman, right? Like, aren't I a woman? And her point standing being that there are oppressed women on many different levels. And that doesn't mean that only the white middle class women should be fought for, that there are women who are slaves and there are women who are working class and there are women who are middle class who all deserve equal rights. And there was a very common Christian thought of because Jesus was a man and because God is like male, women were less Christ-like, men were closer to Christ. And, and the retort that she poses here of Jesus coming from God and a woman was just so it's just like it's a little bit of the like I don't know it's just like so perfect it's like such a, a quick just destroying and flipping of conventional wes wisdom at the time and saying like I'm a woman and I am stronger than all of you because of that so what this is starting to point out is class being an oppressor. So white abolitionists failing to understand that the rising oppression that capitalism brought. Both free whites working in the North and slaves in the South were victims of this economic exploitation to different levels, but they were both victims nonetheless. White abolitions often defended industrialization and capitalism against their own against their own benefit. They were arguing for industrialization and capitalism, and they very, very rarely expressed class consciousness. This led uh, class as an oppressor has led to this aesthetically evil slavery to be rooted against, but left doors open for continued oppression of black and white people alike. So you can see something that is aesthetically and visually evil. Something like chattel slavery is visually abhorrent and disgusting, and 
what a lot of neoliberals, which is a, a line of thinking that is a capitalistic line of thinking, will be able to do is look at something that is so clearly bad and say, that's bad, get rid of it. But then they fail to recognize that the systems that were born after it can lead to oppression in a very quick way, in a way that affects everybody. This goes into the chapter of racism in the women's suffrage movement. We've already seen a little dabble of it in the last chapter when you see like Lucretia Mott and Stanton not having black voices at their meetings. Meetings. This chapter goes very, very deep into the detail of black women experiencing racism in the suffrage and in the suffrage movement. So the Equal Rights Association happened in 1867. Elizabeth Stanton, who was previously an abolitionist, and you know now this is obviously post Civil War, was so hard fighting against black suffrage, saying, "With the black man, we now have we have no new element in government, but with the education and elevation of women, we have a power that is to develop the Saxon race into." a higher and nobler life and thus by the law of attraction to lift all races to a more even platform that can never be reached in the political isolation of the sexes. You'll see this invoking of this term, the Saxon race, of course, just meaning white people. So Stanton, again, a, a staunch abolitionist and a staunch woman suffrage movement is saying black men add nothing to our society. We need white women to vote. That way we can make white people better off as a, as a, as a race with black people being uh, freed from slavery, Stanton believed that they were now that black men and women and white women were just equals, and allowing them to vote, allowing black men to vote, would be hurting white women because they are denying a right from the women by allowing black people to vote, which of course is not true. Later, she goes on to <laughs> regret supporting abolition altogether because she perceived that it hurt her overall cause. So Stanton demanded a Republican Party to give women suffrage as a reward for winning the Civil War. Republicans denied suffrage. It just wasn't smart politically for them to give women the power. And this makes a lot of sense when you sort of realize the Civil War wasn't done for a moral reason. The North wasn't just good guys fighting against the South because slavery is bad. There was slavery in the North. There were plenty of racist people in the North. It was done because the Northern bourgeoisie were being hurt by Southern slave labor economy. The South was getting, you know, much cheaper, effectively free labor, right, from their slaves. And the North couldn't compete with that because they didn't have slavery. And they're like, well, we got to end slavery. They're making too much money. We aren't able to make money up here. The anti-South uh, sentiment didn't mean that pro that the anti-South sentiment did not imply pro-Black liberation inherently, nor pro-woman suffrage stances. So Stanton and Susan B. Anthony both believed that abolition was the end goal for Black people. They sort of ignored that idea of systemic and individual racism and how that can negatively affect Black people in a post-chattel slavery world. Frederick Douglass believed abolition had been accomplished, but only in name alone, saying, quote, slavery is not abolished until the black man has the ballot. So Frederick Douglass was fighting for black suffrage, rightfully so, because he sort of was able to recognize, as I think anybody should be able to at the time, if black people were just freed from chattel slavery but not allowed to vote, there's really no way to prevent racism and like further oppression of black people as a whole from ongoing. Violent mobs were attacking in the wake of the abolition of slavery. Uh, in New York in 1863, a thousand people were killed by a pro-slavery anti-draft mob. These are people in the North. <laughs> in New York that killed people because they were so upset that ab abolition um, occurred. And in Memphis and New Orleans in 1866, there was burning of ch uh, schools and churches and black uh, domiciles, black houses, and they used as an act of terrorism against black women as well. So very clearly, abolition was not widely popular, even in the North. It was probably more popular in the North, but not widely accepted. So Susan B. Anthony, it's a name that we've all heard in America. Susan B. Anthony publicly praised Congressman James Brooks, who was a self-avowed white supremacist and a former editor of a pro-slavery newspaper. He was interested in women's suffrage only to counteract the 2 million black votes with 2 million white women votes. So Susan B. Anthony was <laughs> so against um, black suffrage that she brought on a congressman solely to like counteract the black vote, if that makes sense. Frederick Douglass maintained support for both. He had no reason why black uh, people and women shouldn't be able to vote. He had more urgency for the black vote because of the publicly accepted violence against black people. It just wasn't happening on such a large scale against white women uh, where there were public violent demonstrations against black abolition. Uh, Frederick Douglass called for the 15th Amendment to include all the disenfranchised, including 
including women. So Joyner Truth recognized the underlying racism in opposing black suffrage, even if black women were not allowed to vote. So so Joyner Truth originally was more on the side of um, like Susan B. Anthony and Stanton, but was able to recognize it makes so much more sense to allow black men to vote, even if that means black women were not allowed to vote which of course makes sense. So the Equal Rights Association was successfully dissolved at the behest of Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. They then formed the National Women's Suffrage Association. To be fair to them, some male leaders in the ERA were male supremacists, and there was a black ERA leader, George Downing, who claimed that it was God's will for men to dominate women. And Stanton, in response, said, When Mr. Downing puts the question to me, are you willing to have the colored man enfranchised before the women? I say no, I would not trust him with my rights. Degraded, oppressed himself, he would be more despotic with the governing power than ever our Saxon rulers are. If women are still to be represented by men, then I say let only the highest type of manhood stand at the helm of the state. So while there were, like, male supremacists in the ERA, it's very clear that Stanton didn't really oppose the ERA because of the male supremacy, she was upset that black people were getting rights. The response to sexism cannot be racism. That gets you nowhere. It is a zero-sum game. And it's so sad to see like Stanton and Susan B. Anthony as, again, early abolitionist leaders and, and early women's suffrage leaders to just immediately go so racist so quick. Like as soon as they weren't getting what they wanted immediately um, after the Civil War, they were just like, we're racist, actually. And we are upset that the black people are freed. So emancipation was different uh, for black men and black women. And Davis here wants to talk about the emancipation according to black women. According to the 1890s, census, there were 2.7 million black girls and women over 10 <clears throat> and 1 million plus of those worked for wages, splitting between agriculture, household, domestic service, laundry work, and a very, very small fraction in manufacturing. The post-Civil War era created something called the convict lease system, which was just straight up modeled after slavery. I'm sure a lot of you are aware of the caveats in the 14th and 15th Amendments that say slavery not allowed, asterisk unless they're in jail. And that's something that was born, this was born out of that, that little asterisk. So slaveholders in the past had a limit to how cruel they could be to their quote unquote property. They couldn't like injure their slaves too much because they needed to have them work for them. However, convicts were supplied by the state, so they were treated as disposable labor. This is where you get the depictions of people working on chain gangs from. Women uh, and men equally worked on these chain gangs where they were tied together and forced to march in, you know, extremely hot heat and were being uh, not only physically assaulted, but the women were suffering from sexual assault as well. And W.B. Dubois points out that this ruling, this convict lease system, just gave a profit motive to imprison people unjustly. Because when too many black people were dying from being in the chain gangs, they would just, you know, go out and arrest a couple more people. That way people could make money off of them again. That's still something we see today, of course, in for-profit prisons. It's, it's, it's a little disheartening to see these systems that were born in the late 1800s as a way to like reinstate slavery still exist today. Something known as slave markets existed all the way up until and past the 1940s. Now, some of you might have grandparents that are older than that. That's, not, again, not 80 years ago. It's not that long. It's really not that long ago, considering, you know, how time works, uh, which is a flat circle sometimes. So immigrant white women were treated as poorly as freed black women. Often they were forced to take these extremely low paying, extremely unrewarding housework jobs. So slave markets began to arise where in corner street corners in New York or any city really, but as an example, in 1940 New York, you could go to corners and women would just be standing there and waiting for work. People would show up, take them away, work extremely long hours, and sometimes they wouldn't even get paid. They would just drop them off because the women had no power to contest. There's no morals or ethics in the sense of these people coming up and picking women up to just go force them to work. But that's all women could do uh, for work sometimes because no other options were really present. This next chapter talks about the uh, black women's perspective in terms of liberation and education. Knowledge denial was often used as a control method under slavery. Slave masters would deny slaves learning in fear that it would lead to mass revolts. They were aware that as people got more knowledge and more uh, educated that they would be able to figure out how to get 
get out of their system. So they would prevent black people and slaves from learning anything. The prevailing ideology at the time just suggested that black people were just intellectually unable to advance their knowledge. But if that were true, why would slaves consistently fight to learn? Of course, that's not true because that desire of slaves to learn was ever present. In 1793, not that long after the United States was formed as a country, the uh, there's an ex-slave that built Katie Ferguson's school for the poor. She bought her own freedom and then taught black and white kids, possibly both boys and girls. In 1833, Prudence Crandall was a white teacher who defended black girls' right to attend her school. Eventually, she was arrested for doing so. In 1851, Myrtilla Minor founded Black Teachers College in Washington, D.C. Eventually, that school was burned down intentionally, but it was later opened as a public school, which still stands today as a like a monument to La Minor's work. So black people wanted to learn, and uh, that should sound obvious now because of course it's obvious, but back then they were trying to push this narrative that black people were just unable to learn due to being black, right? An extremely racist thought. The women's suffrage movement around the turn of the century from the 1800s to the 1900s had a very, very high rise in the influence of racism in the movement. So Henry Blackwell was this guy who was a big leader in the National American Women's Suffrage Association or NASA. He wanted to solve what he called the black voting problem. He wanted to attach a literacy qualification to voting. That was his solution to prevent black men from voting, which again, this was concocted in the 1900s, like the early 1900s. And that is still something you see people fight for today. In some, some Southern states, people in our government will say we should attach a literacy qualification. You can go on Reddit and just see people's being like, I can't believe this dumb person votes. It's like, yeah, guess what? Everybody should be able to vote. I think, is that a radical stance? Back then it was, and apparently today it is too, in some circles. So this guy, Henry Blackwell, was actually backed by Stanton and Anthony, and they quoted him in some of their works completely uncritically, with one quote being, if black suffrage passes, we will be flooded with ignorant, impoverished blacks from every state of the union. If women's suffrage passes, we invite to our borders people of character and position, of wealth and education, who can hesitate to decide when the question lies, who can hesitate to decide? Side when the question lies between educated women and ignorant blacks. So Stanton and Susan P. Anthony, again, just went straight into the racism card here. And they were just outright saying black men as a whole were just worse than white women as a whole. That was their stance that they championed. As this became more and more accepted, this racism, they started to become legalized into laws. So laws began forming in Southern states. One of the first ones was Mississippi. In 1888, they legalized segregation. In 1890, they ratified a new constitution which denied black suffrage. There were other states that followed, such as South Carolina, North Carolina, Alabama, Virginia, Georgia, and Oklahoma. In 1893, the Supreme Court reversed the 1875 Civil Rights Act, which gave rise to many Jim Crow and lynch laws. In 1896, Plessy v. Ferguson, that is when they first announced the separate but equal doctrine. These were all, of course, extremely huge pieces of what would eventually be fought against in the civil rights movement in the 1960s. All of the roots came, what, like 30 years? 20 to 30 years post-Civil War. Ida B. Wells rose in the late 1800s as an activist against a lot of this stuff. She later founded the first Black Women's Suffrage Club and actually worked pretty closely with Susan B. Anthony. She would often chastise Susan B. Anthony on her indifference to racism uh, and staying neutral while murders and lynchings were taking place. A lot of her work centered around uh, lynchings. So in 1889 to 1899, there was 100 to 200 lynches a year. Anthony refused to see the wrongdoings pointed out by Wells, which only worsened her views over time. Ida B. Wells really tried to work with Susan B. Anthony to be a voice of reason and try to convince her to work uh, in a pro-black and pro-woman cause. But Susan B. Anthony was just so goddamn racist that she couldn't get over like being upset that women couldn't vote yet. Around the turn of the century, there was also a huge rise in eugenics. In the 1901 Nassau Convention, which was the very first convention not led by Susan B. Anthony, she still uh, showed up and gave an opening message, arguing women had been corrupted by man's appetites and passions, and it was time for them to fulfill their purpose of becoming saviors of the race. It would be through women's, quote, intelligence and eman emancipation that the race shall be purified. It is through women Women that the race is to be redeemed. For this reason, I ask for her immediate and unconditional emancipation from all political, industrial, and religious subjection. There was a new president, Carrie Chapman Catt, who pointed to 
three great obstacles to the women's suffrage movement, that being militarism, prostitution, and the blacks and Native Americans. So from Susan B. Anthony, who, while she maybe worked with uh, black people, was still racist herself, the new leader was potentially even more racist and was pointing out even more problematic things. So black women, as a response, knew that they were not welcome. They were increasingly becoming unwelcome in the white women's movements. And so black women's clubs started to arise. Black clubs were first started as a response to white clubs ousting them, and some internal rifts formed between some of the club members, unfortunately. Ida B. Wells and Mary Church Terrell were both very big players in this era of women's rights and black rights. Terrell was the daughter of a slave who received a considerable inheritance from her slave master father. According to uh, this afforded Terrell many opportunities. She was the fourth black woman in the United States to graduate from college. So she had a very affluent beginning, which allowed her to become very educated. Wells claims that Terrell kept her personally from attending the 1899 convention of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs because Terrell was the leader and Ida B. Wells was not invited, which thought, which made her think that she was afraid of Wells challenging her position. These two remained opposed until their deaths, which really sucked because they both did a ton of really, really important work. They just could not see eye to eye, which of course weakened their movement and causes overall. As the uh, time went on, women's working rights became a bigger and bigger issue that needed to be focused on. So the National Labor Union was founded in 1866. This called for the unionization of all men and women's labor. Women were invited in 1868. So only a couple years later, they invited women and Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Stanton both uh, attended. The National Colored Labor, labor Union was founded a year later and they immediately welcomed women in. They didn't want to make the same mistakes by the other labor union by not allowing women to join. Trade unionism was never fully accepted by Anthony and Stanton. Anthony was actually excluded from the 1869 convention because she pushed women to work as scabs when women working in a printing press were striking. Now, she tried to claim that this exclusion was an example of men ruling over women fairly, but she actively was pushing scab work while member of a labor union, which is, that's like the one thing you don't do as a member of a union is you don't scab. That's like the big no-no. <laughs> so they kicked her out because of that. Susan B. Anthony was actually pretty anti-labor in general. She was quoted as saying, the great distinctive advantage possessed by the working men of this republic is that the son of the humblest citizen, black or white, has equal chances with the son of the richest in the land. Literally just pull you up by the bootstraps, uh, American dream, anybody can become anything type beat which showed her complete lack of familiarity with working class people. She believed sexism was the ultimate oppression, much more than class oppression or racism. She was completely blind as a, a middle class white woman to the oppression of class or race. And as we've seen, pretty unwilling to learn otherwise. She was pretty <laughs> adamant against learning <laughs> those things. She also said, quote, an oligarchy of wealth where the rich govern the poor, an oligarchy of learning where the educated govern the ignorant, or even an oligarchy of race where the Saxon rules the African might be endured, but this oligarchy of sex, which makes fathers, brothers, husbands, sons, the oligarchs over the mother and sisters, the wife and daughters of every household, which ordains all men sovereigns, all women subjects, carries discord and rebellion into the home of every nation, into every home of the nation. So just saying, yeah, women being oppressed is worse than all these other things. White white people ruling over black people is okay, as long as women are equals with men, is what she's saying. So this all, of course, was being pushed towards the eventual ratification of the 19th Amendment, which in the United States is the women's rights movement, or the women's suffrage amendment. Many southern states were against the amendment, but they got 36 out of the 36, the supermajority, required votes after months of deliberation, which allowed women to win suffrage. However, black women were still prevented from voting in the South. The Ku Klux Klan was very active in violence, and an example of that is in America's Georgia. 250 black women tried to vote, but they were turned away by an, a racist election manager. So while white women were able to vote pretty freely freely once the 19th amendment was ratified black people were still being oppressed solely on the color of their skin this next chapter outlines a lot of the communist women and uh the introduction of communism in america as a way to fight for workers rights so we've talked a lot about the class oppression which is independent and un it, it overarches you know it, it, it doesn't care if you're black or white doesn't care if you're man or woman class oppression oppresses everybody so in 1848 the communist manifesto was written 
by Karl Marx and uh, Frederick Engels. The Socialist Party supported Marxism and women's rights. Ashania, thank you for the follow. And was only pro was the only pro women suffrage party for years. However, they still had an anti black sentiment. In 1908, socialist women organized a mass demonstration in New York City, which to this day is still celebrated as an International Women's Day. How many people knew that that the International Women's Day that is celebrated in March is rooted in a communist socialist organized mass demonstration? I had no fucking idea. That's sick as hell. The Communist Party founded in 1999 in the United States. They were a combining of a couple of groups: the International Workers of the World, or IWW, and another group. The IWW was called the Wobblies. Uh, their ultimate goal was socialism, and they recognized black oppression. They were one of the first socialist groups to really work that into their into their messaging. And the IWW and socialist women, and the IWW and the Communist Party was founded, and women were invited into its ranks at that time. So Lucy Parsons is one of these early communist women in America. She's often referred to as a devoted wife of Albert Parsons, but really her activism started nearly a decade before Albert Parsons was murdered in the Haymarket Massacre and continued for 55 years after. So a lot of her history gets erased as just being someone's wife. So she, the Haymarket Massacre was a bombing at a pro-labor rally in Chicago on uh, 1886, which is now celebrated as or remembered as International Workers' Day. Again, another day in American history that was formed as a <laughs> communist, like, or a pro-labor rally that sometimes gets lost, I feel like, in, in, in modern politics. Like, the root of American struggles of being so pro-labor is lost nowadays. She became a member of the Socialist Party in 1877, and she wrote for the Socialist newspaper while she was there. She argued that class struggle was to be a joining force for all races and sexes, and she spoke for Chicago sex workers in their plights. One of the first two women to join the IWW as well, with someone else named uh, Mary Jones, known as Mother, and she has this brilliant quote, We, the women of the country, have no ballot, even if we wish to use it, but we have our labor. Wherever wages are to be reduced, the capitalist class uses women to reduce them. So pointing out the idea that women work for cheaper and we need to recognize that as women and fight against capital in a way where we can vote with our labor because we are not afforded the right to vote. Ella Reeve Bloor was a Socialist Party member and important leader. She hitchhiked across the country until the age of 62. She did all of her activism by just hitchhiking across the country, which is insane. She would give speeches as she was hitchhiking around fighting for socialist issues. She was sometimes, uh, or she gave speeches fighting for the socialist cause, which was sometimes blind to black issues. But as a communist, she fought for numerous she fought numerous manifestations of racism an example of this is she was arrested in the 1930s for giving a pro strike speech at a chicken farm so two people were arrested with her mr and mrs floyd they were all put into prison mr and mrs floyd were black and the locals went to go bail out ella reeve bloor and she said nope don't bail me out until you have enough money for all of us because i will not leave my my black comrades in here uh, forever. So she fought actively for black rights as well as labor rights. She believed that the working class cannot be revolutionary force if still succumbing to racist thought, which is a very, very sentient and correct position. Anita Whitney was born to a wealthy San Franciscan family, and she was actually raised by socialists. She was eventually a chairperson of Cal the California Communist Party. She staunchly supported anti-racist causes, and in 1914, she joined the Socialist Party. The San Francisco Bay Area NAACP offered and she accepted the executive committee person. That's how much she fought for black rights. She was one of the first members of the Communist Party in 1919, and she gave a speech in Oakland in 1919 at the anti-communist raids, where she spoke against lynchings and the black rapist myth. She called for white women to stand with black people, and she was eventually arrested for this speech. On her thoughts on the Communist Party, she said, why it has given purpose to my life, the Communist Party is the hope of the world. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was active in the Socialist and Communist Party for nearly 60 years years. 1906, when she was only 16 years old, she gave a speech at a Harlem Socialist Club titled What Socialism Will Do for Women. The speech was so powerful that it turned her male supremacist father into a feminist thinker. She was arrested for street speaking without a permit later that year while she was only 16. She joined, she joined the Wobblies and became an organization leader, eventually resigning from the Socialist Party because she believed it became sterile with compared to the grassroots movement like ID, IWW. She worked with a native rights leader, Frank Little, who was later lynched for striking. Flynn was tried for conspiracy against the U.S. implicated in his lynching. So she was fighting for black rights, for native rights, for women's rights. At the, again, she started doing this when she was 16 years old, which is just amazing. 
And she was arrested for trying to overthrow the government in the 1940s due to the anti-communist thought of McCarthyism rising due to the Cold War with Russia. At the time, the USSR, of course. And she said, quote, every inequality and disability inflicted on American white women is aggravated a thousandfold among black women who are triply exploited as black, as workers, and as women. So using this idea of (laughs) the idea that like women being oppressed is worse for black women being oppressed because their racism exists and that white women should fight using the power that they do have to afford it to afford better lives to everybody claudia jones was born in trinidad and she worked to free the scottsboro scottsboro nine who were nine black boys who were wrongly accused of she became acquainted with the communist party through doing this she often would criticize white progressives for not working with black labor union efforts and she argued white women communists bore more responsibility in protecting black women given the power that they did have she was arrested with flynn under the 1951 smith act they were placed she was placed in a legal colored only prison cell and separated from flynn and mccarthyism actually pressured her to be deported to london where she then continued her activism but unfortunately she died very young due to failing health the claudia jones and flynn worked together a ton uh, and were very very important activists Okay, this is the big chapter where they talk a lot about rape, so if you don't like that, there's going to be a time code at the bottom. But for now, we're going to talk about rape, racism, and the myth of the black rapist. So rape laws were forged to only defend wealthy people and their wives slash daughters. And of course, rape had always been underreported and underpunished, but that doesn't mean it hadn't been weaponized. In 1930 to 1967, there were 455 men executed for in the United States. 405 of them are black. The implication, of course, being that only 50 of the people (laughs) executed were not black. So this myth of this black rapist was being used to just extrajudicially, judiciously almost just kill black people. The myth of the black rapist of white women is the twin of the myth of the bad black woman, both designed to apologize for and facilitate the continued exploitation of black men and women. Black women perceived this connection very clearly and were early in the forefront of the fight against lynching. So while black women were early in the forefront against lynching, white women were a little slower to recognize this. Now, Susan Brown Miller is an author who released a book in 1975. All right, are you still in here, mom? This is the one that you're younger than, or you're older than, I mean. 1975, a lot of people will have parents who are older than this book. And I, I want to reiterate that because this is not that long ago. This is less than 50 years ago. I had to do some quick math. This is less than 50 years ago. So she wrote a book called Against Our Will, Men, Women, and It is still today acclaimed as a majorly important feminist piece of literature. And to her credit, Davis does talk about how good of a piece of work this is talking about, well, Blake, you're young. I'm an old okay i'm 30 i got old parents all right not old mom don't mom close your ears davis does give brown miller credit here where she says this is a very very good book but in it she also perpetuates the black rapist myth this is susan brown miller's interpretation of emmett till's death emmett till of course one of the most widely known cases of a public lynching of a young black boy in the book she writes emmett till was going to show his black buddies that he and by inference they could get a white woman and carolyn bryant was the nearest convenient object. In concrete terms, the accessibility of all white women was on review. And what of the wolf whistle? Till's gesture of adolescent bravado. The whistle was the whistle as no small tweet of hubba bubba, hubba hubba, or melodious approval for a well-turned ankle. It was a deliberate insult just short of physical assault. And a last reminder to Carolyn Bryant that this black boy, Till, had in mind to possess her. So in this, you know, I haven't read the piece or the book that she wrote, but in this book that's heralded as like, you know, an extremely important feminist piece of literature, which I'm sure, as Davis writes, it has its merits. She is pretty much saying because Emmett Till whistled at a white woman and because he is a black person, that he was intending to sexually and physically assault her and therefore it was okay for Emmett Till to get murdered and lynched publicly, which is just perpetuating this idea that black men, even though Emmett Till was a child, just want to do There were other pieces of literature that came out around the same time. So Diana Russell's 1975 politics of implies that a quote unquote typical rapist is a man of color. Jean McKellar's 1975 the bait and the trap claimed it just claimed out of nowhere 90% of all are committed by black men. At the time, the FBI's figure was 47%, which of course is 
still false. It's still too high. But she just doubled that for no reason other than racism and just implied that black people growing up in the ghetto teaches them to be violent inherently. So there were these feminist thought leaders in the 1970s who were still pushing this white feminism, this idea that this black, this black rapist myth was so pervasive in black men that they're that they can't outgrow it. They can never get away from it. So while they had a more modern, subtle racism, that being the books written in 1975, Winfred Winfield Collins wrote books in argued these more pseudo biological reasons for the black myth, saying in the books, two of the black man's most prominent characteristics are the utter lack of chastity and complete ignorance of veracity. The black man's sexual laxity considered so immoral or even criminal in the white man's civilization may have been all but a virtue in the habitat of his origin. Therefore, nature developed in him intense sexual passion to offset his high death rate. So while the 1975 thought leaders were like, not the band, the 1975 thought leaders were just like, it's just because of social conditions that black men want to all the time that was a more accepted modern version of racism collins would write it's in their dna black men have to do violent attacks because they lived in a harder lifestyle it's in their dna they can't outgrow it the yeah this is this stuff is really bad this chapter was pretty heavy there was of course the black man myths don't only hurt black men this implied the quote always promiscuous black woman myths implying that black women are welcoming to white men's aggressions because they're black uh, men partners were aggressive and alien, and which led to black women's claims of rape being held way less seriously when it came to uh, prosecution. In 1975, a woman by the name of Joan Little was accused of murdering a prison guard. She was the first woman in the United States history to be acquitted of murder using against and that sexual assault as a reason. So she got out of doing jail time because the prison guard, the white prison guard, was attempting to sexually assault her and she murdered him. While she was being, you know, while her story was being shared on the news, she used that time to call for the release of another inmate, Delbert Tibbs. He was on death's row for a false accusation of rape. White women did not join this cause, but black women did, calling for the release of Tibbs. And in 1978, Tibbs had all of his charges dropped, proving his innocence. And then white anti-rape activists championed him. So they kind of still had to wait because they were like, oh, well, they still had that like in their brain of like, oh, black man rapist myth. And so I can't believe it until like he's legally cleared. So sexual assaults predates lynchings by a very, very long time. Sexual assaults have been happening all of human history as a, a quote unquote effective method in controlling people. Also used in shadow slavery, controlling both men and women alike. Lynching was extremely rare because as we said before, killing their quote unquote property was a bad investment and flogging was used as a physical punishment because it wouldn't kill the slave. The black rapist myth was created to justify the public lynching. That myth did not exist until after slavery was abolished. There was not a single, there was not one accusation of black rape occurring during the Civil War. Not a single one. So that really points to the idea of a post-abolition world where they needed to find a way, a reason to justify just murdering black men. So lynching was used by new groups, the KKK and the Knights of the White Camellia. Camellia? Camellia. The KKK and the Knights of the White Camellia. This was done to, quote, prevent black supremacy over whites. And a South Carolina Senator, Ben Tillman, around 1900 said, quote, when stern and sad-faced white men put to death a creature in human form who has deflowered a white woman, they have avenged the greatest wrong, the blackest crime. Of course, equating rape with only being a black man's crime and deflowering a white woman, a white woman being the most pure and the only real or the highest form of like creature. Like it, it was so sad that a white woman was raped. If a black woman was raped, it wouldn't have been as sad. And that was a senator. That was somebody in the government at the time. So anti-lynching campaigns became very big. Mentioned before, Mary Talbert started anti-lynching crusaders in 1922. This was done under the NAACP auspices and 30 years after Ida B. Wells started her anti-lynching efforts. She attempted to petition 1 million signatures against lynching. The Association of Southern Women for the Prevention of Lynching was founded by Jesse Daniel Ames in 1930. This spoke against Southern white women's involvement in lynching. Southern white women would often bring their kids 
kids and sometimes actually be active members of the mob, which would of course just normalize the, the disgusting acts of lynching. So she would chastise actively the white women doing that and got 40,000 signatures to their pledge against lynching, which at the time, I mean, 40,000 signatures, you know, that's physical signatures. That's a very, very uh, impressive feat. So this will feed into the movements of racism, birth control, and reproductive rights and their history in the United States. So the birth control movement has seldom been able to unite women of different social backgrounds. I said before that this book is dated because she says that the biggest win was Roe v. Wade in 1973, which of course was a massive win. Unfortunately, as of recording this, Roe v. Wade has been overturned by the Supreme Court. So what was seen as one of the biggest wins in 1973 has been wiped off of the uh, ability for American women to be offered one of the biggest uh, rights to birth control and being abortion. Abortion rights fight didn't evolve, involve many women of color. The reasons offered at the time were that women of color were just so overburdened by their fight against racism and they just weren't like really conscious of their centrality of their sexism and all black people just think abortion is genocide so we shouldn't talk to them about it. But these were all primarily racist assumptions uh, that didn't really digest why women of color weren't involved in this fight. The pro-abortion movements would sometimes call for sterilizations as a like counter to not being able to get an abortion, which was seen as black, but was seen by women of color as an extreme method uh, that would be, of course, more primarily used against black people than white people. Uh, some backing as to how it didn't. What's the way I want to say this? The way that that doesn't make sense. Now, you know, that kind of is all bull is that 80% of deaths in New York in the years preceding Roe v. Wade passing were black and Puerto Rican women. And after Roe, about 50% of abortions were black and Puerto Rican women in New York. So to say that women of color didn't want to fight for abortion just because they were too busy or whatever is just asinine because they were the ones most frequently using it as a method of uh, last resort birth control. Being pro-abortion rights is not being proponents of abortion. So free, this is frequency, this frequency alluding to black and Latino women not wanting to bring children into the miserable social conditions they were subjected to. So I think that makes sense, right? I don't think there's a lot of people who are actively saying abortion is like this sick, super cool thing that everybody should do, but it's totally understandable as a response to people not wanting to bring a child into a world where they cannot provide for it. That's still a stance that's held today by a a lot of people, of course, um, that are pro-abortion is being pro-abortion rights does not just mean that like everybody should just be getting abortion all the time was what she was trying to say here. When it came to legal abortions post Roe v. Wade, the Hyde Amendment was passed in 1977. So only a few years after Roe v. Wade was passed or was not passed. It's not a law. A few years after Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade, the Hyde Amendment was passed by Congress, which completely removed federal funding from abortion, which of course primarily affects poorer people. The certain Surgical sterilizations, however, were remained funded by the Department of Health. So this disproportionately affected black, brown, and native women and poor women. The idea of voluntary motherhood was not something that existed always. Historically, women were not allowed input on childbearing. It was the husband's choice on whether or not they were going to have kids and when and how many. The Grimka sisters pushed for voluntary motherhood and marriage. This movement sort of peaked in the 1870s with, and called for abstinence within marriage as a tool to prevent their or to increase their ability to choose of whether or not they would have a kid. And they knew if we could all get a movement of abstinence that it would be this really sick form of protest. However, this ideology wasn't really broadly available to working class women because they were more focused on economic survival and many found it hard to identify with embryonic birth control women. By 1900, white birth rate was declining significantly. There was no contraceptives at the time, just less sex was happening as a whole, primarily due to potentially the more urban lifestyle meaning less need for kids. When you lived on farms, you needed more kids to help, you know, harvest and do all this stuff. It was just less realistic to have that many kids in the city. However, this birthed the narrative of race suicide in the United States. So everybody's favorite president, the Rough Rider himself, President Teddy Roosevelt, in a 1905 speech was quoted in his speech as saying, race purity must be maintained. And in the 1906 State of the Union, he reprimanded well-born white women of willful sterility. So white women were going through willful sterility as a way to prevent having more kids. And in his uh, speech specifically, the quote was, the one sin which the penalty is national death, race suicide. Now, he was only concerned with white race. He was not concerned about any other race. He was just really upset that white women were choosing to not have more kids. <clears throat> Margaret Sanger was the woman who first coined the term birth control. 
she found the calling to fight for her birth control as a nurse in New York's Lower East Side. She met a 28-year-old woman named Sadie Sachs, who was in the hospital because she attempted to abort herself and was injured in the process. Sadie then asked the physician how she could prevent getting pregnant, and the doctor responded, just tell your husband to sleep on the on the roof. That was his response to a woman who nearly died because she could not be pregnant, she didn't want to be pregnant, was a joke of like, well, your husband's going to get you pregnant, maybe tell him sleep on the roof. And the uh, Sadie er, Singer had written in a memoir her interaction with Mrs. Sachs, which says, I glanced quickly to Mrs. Sachs. Even through my sudden tears, I could see stamped on her face an expression of absolute despair. We simply looked at each other, saying no word until the door had closed behind the doctor. Then she lifted her thin, blue-veined hands and clasped them beseechingly. He can't understand. He's only a man. But you do, don't you? Please tell me the secret, and I'll never breathe it to a soul. Please. One year later, Sadie Sachs died from a failed self-abortion. But this was at a time in the United States where because safe access to birth control methods or socially accepted access to birth control methods were not available, women were dying. And they were desperate to find ways to fight for the right to have individuality and the ability to choose. That's all they wanted was the ability to choose whether or not they could have kids. Eugenics in America really started to rise in the early to mid 1900s. Sanger actually left the Socialist Party to focus solely on the birth control movement. However, in doing so, marital was not legally recognized until 1993. Yeah, that's a very common thing, unfortunately. A very common reason why so many women have kids that they don't want. So Sanger left the Socialist Party to focus solely on the birth control movement. She unfortunately became more susceptible to racist and anti-immigrant propaganda, much like the you know many white women before her with Susan B. Anthony and Stanton. In 1919, she said the chief issue of birth control is, quote, more children from the fit, less from the unfit. So, you know, just who's deciding who's fit and unfit is the question when it comes to anything eugenics wise. Uh, the American Eugenics Society was founded in 1922 and was not disbanded until 2019. Now, I know that everybody in this chat and watching this video has parents older than 2019. <laughs> I know that for a fact. This is this American Eugenics Society. This wasn't in the book, but Nazi Germany used Americans studies on eugenics as a way to implement their their teachings. That's how at the forefront American eugenics was. We were leading the world in our eugenics thought that it got outsourced to Nazi Germany. So the director of the American Eugenics Society when it was founded was director Guy Irving Branch. And his goal was to, quote, prevent the American people from being replaced by alien, meaning immigrants, or black stock, whether it be by immigration or by overly high birth rates among others in this country. So he wanted white people to have more kids or... The easier way to do that is to make non-white people have less kids. How can you do that? Great question. By 1932, 26 states passed sterilization laws for unfit people. Sanger applauded this success, saying, quote, morons, mental defectives, epileptics, illiterates, paupers, unemployables, criminals, prostitutes, and dope fiends ought to be sterilized. But she wasn't a complete monster, you see, because she thought people could either choose, either be sterilized or be put into a prison camp. I'm not familiar with uh, Buck v. Bell, but this was a this was a relatively common line of thinking at the time, which was, hey, if you're a bad person and we'll define what bad is, we'll just make it so you can't have kids. And then that way you won't have more bad kids, which is, of course, completely ignoring the societal and economic reasons why people might be, you know, something like illiterate, like illiterate people were being sterilized, like just because they couldn't read. That's something that is fixable with education. Unemployable. What the hell does unemployable mean? Buck versus Bell? Wait, I might talk. We go into story. I have a story in a second about women who were forcibly sterilized. But yes, uh, people who sell drugs should be forcibly sterilized, according to Margaret Sanger. This is an example of some non-white sterilizations. 1973. 1973. In the wake of Roe v. Wade. Of course, we said abortions were, in 1977, removed from federal funding. In 1973, sterilizations were still funded by the government. So in 1973, the mother of of Minnie Lee and Mary Alice, who were 12 and 14 at the time, was living in public housing, and she was not able to read, so she unknowingly signed for her daughters to be sterilized. She was approached by social workers for the Department of Health and Education and Welfare and didn't explain what she was signing. She just signed an X. Then they took her two daughters and forcibly sterilized them. On the picture on the left, it's the mother, 
and her three daughters. The one eldest daughter was 17, wasn't home at the time. Later, when she was home, was approached by social workers and said, hey, come with us. You're going to have to go get sterilized. But they didn't say that. They just said, hey, come with us. We're, your mom told us we need to take you to this place. And she refused. So she escaped the sterilization. But a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old were sterilized because they lived in public housing and they were like, they were claimed to be like imbeciles. They are still alive today. And this was not a single case thing. Thousands of black girls and women were being sterilized against their will. Some women were forced to be sterilized or else forfeit their welfare which is obviously an impossible, disgusting choice to put onto somebody. In North Carolina, in 1933 to 1974, there were over 7,600 sterilizations, often justified as being mentally deficient persons. 5,000 of those sterilizations were of black women. If that doesn't tell you how racist this entire program was, then I don't know what will. There's a doctor in South Carolina, Dr. Clovis Pierce, who refused to aid pregnancy of women who were on welfare, but instead forced them to be sterilized before he performed. He did this as a way to pro protest people on welfare from using his tax dollars. So he would not perform his duties as a doctor for pregnant women unless they agreed to get sterilized after they give birth. That's absolutely correct. Uh, detained immigrants were sterilized with their knowledge in 2017. That is absolutely correct. At the U.S. Uh, southern border. Dr. Pierce, as a protest against welfare pe recipients using his tax dollars, was himself paid $60,000 for the sterilizations he performed. So he was stealing money from taxpayers for doing this. In 1972, the HEW funded between 100 to 200,000 sterilizations. In one year alone, Hitler's Germany, the entire reign, they sterilized nearly 250,000 thousand people. So out of the entire reign of Nazi Germany, the United States did that in one to two years. Funded by the United States government in the 1970s. In the 1970s. That is really hard to uh, under... Really just disgusting. And by 1976, approximately 24% of all Native women in the United States had been sterilized. A quarter of all Native women had been sterilized. This is going into the last chapter here. And Davis, Davis talks about the absolute of housework from a working class perspective. Now, in this chapter, she talks about the socialization of housework and how historically housework was demeaning work that was assigned to women, especially non-white women, and not seen as like something noble or like valuable. And so it's been an underpaid, underappreciated job. The birth of the housewife is regressive and harmful for all women, as Davis states. And they aren't really recognized in society as a labor value compared to men's labor. Now, this book came out in 1981, but you can see this still today with a lot of discussions of a stay at home mom, which is the new, you know, more accepted version of the term housewife, not really being appreciated for the labor added by being a stay at home mom. The wages for housework movement was born out of this and was seen as a necessary future to revolutionize home life and lift women up. And it was an ultimate call for an end to the reign of the profit motive in private lives. Davis goes into the idea of, when she says socialized housework, it's this idea of people who are stay-at-home workers or, you know, taking care of their children should be subsidized or, you know, given funds for their labor by the government in order to incentivize people being at home and, like, you know, raising their kids properly with attention. And as Blake points out, nannies aren't paid super great. And, well, nannies aren't paid super great. And actual, like, like programs to send kids to are like prohibitively expensive. So it's like a catch 22 where it's like either somebody, somebody that you can afford as a family working in the United States today, you can afford to pay somebody a an extremely low wage. And so now that person who is working is being taken advantage of, or a uh, facility has to charge an insane amount of money. And so the parents are like unable to afford it. It's a, it's a really bad position that we're in and it's only worsened due to rising costs and inflation and the gap of uh, worker productivity versus uh, compensation for their wages since the since the 1980s. But yeah, it was a very it was a long chapter. I felt like a lot of it didn't fully line up to like a 2024 perspective on it. But the overall arching idea of at home labor being undervalued is very very prescient and very very uh, important to discuss in terms of advancing women's rights. And that was the book. And who's going to look after all these old white women with found illness? Yeah, that's true. And that would also fall under the, the uh, umbrella of housework, right? End of life care. End of life care is so expensive. And it's not because the workers who are doing the end of life care are getting compensated so well. It's because the companies are charging out the for it. And you're right. And our economy means, yeah, if you don't have two workers in a household, 
that's rare. It's rare that a household with a couple doesn't have both of them working just due to so many of our eco economic positions today. So if you watch this and you liked it, I, I really recommend this book. Um, there is no audio book on it, I think just because it's one of her older works, but it was it was really good. And I mentioned at the beginning, like, I know it gets really heavy in parts when it comes to talking about like, you know, sexual assault or like the living conditions, but the sections on like socialism and communism and like pro-labor rights in the United States were to me so like strangely uplifting or like like it's it's fucking awesome to me that like we were at a point in America and like the late 1800s where we had a chance we had like this window where we could have built a brilliant society like an absolutely amazing society where so many people came together and created a society that works for everybody and we were so close to doing it and then because of racism and i think that because well it's because of three things believe it or not it's because of <laughs> sexism racism and class oppression as the book is titled women race and class and we've been like dis disjunted from each other where there's a lack of intersectionality between people fighting for class rights and fighting you know like against racism and against sexism and class consciousness is ultimately what davis and many marxists or socialists or communists believe is uh most important the idea of class solidarity and understanding that your issue and why your job sucks is not because of the immigrants coming into the united states or the uh amount of black people who are at your school or <clears throat> women shopping and eating hot chip and lying it's because of our capitalist society that is draining constantly from all avenues in order to fund the elite bourgeois at the very very top if you enjoyed that we will continue this series um this video should be out relatively soon on youtube and when that happens i will make sure to have the next book chosen for people who are watching it live it's gonna be next wednesday i'll announce it so keep an eye on the discord follow me on twitter i'll tweet it out there at Haas Drysmith. i'll make a post or uh, on instagram as well that's i I just changed it today at Haas Drysmith. Go ahead and follow me there. We'll make the announcement. We'll work together and make sure that we find a sick book that we can all enjoy. If you enjoyed this, if you're not in the Judges Discord, or if you are, you can join for a dollar on patreon.com slash Judges Pod. There is a section to talk about Hashan stuff. So that can be the Leftist Book Club or the video we did earlier about Ozempic and stuff like that. Uh, thank you for all your kind words. Uh, thank you for being along with me in the ride, and I'll see you next Wednesday.